welcome to the remote service for the Rondat Valley United Methodist Church for May 29th, 2022. As well as here, you are seeing us online. We are also in person at the church at 10 a.m. on Sundays at 25 Squid Baker Lane. Uh, we would like to remind you we will be having an antique car show here at the church on June 18th. You can visit our website rvumc.org for more information about that or watch Facebook and YouTube announcements will come through there. Our call to worship this morning. We come to this place of prayer for here we can bring our hopes and dreams, our hidden fears and the doubts we dare wear on our sleeves. We come to this place of grace for here we learn compassion and joy and discover how deeply we are loved. We come with these people called the church to be blessed by the variety of gifts, to live as one for our God. Our opening prayer. God of grace and surprise, keep us watching for signs of the risen Christ. Remind us that we tread on holy ground, a world full of divine presence and possibility. We set aside this hour, gazing at skies on tiptoe, watching with gladness for Christ, who fills all things. Amen. <laughs> he put them in their innermost cell and fastened their feet to the stocks. 
About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors were wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. The jailer called for lights and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. Today's Gospel reading is from the very end of the Gospel of Luke, the 24th chapter. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. I confess that I am ever so slightly notorious within my household for being poor at making a clean break of leaving the house. It's a rare trip, even one as short as to the post office, that doesn't see me pop back into the house after I've left. Sometimes even if I, after I've gotten to the corner stop sign. Church keys, face mask, my wallet. There's almost always something that I realize I should have brought, but forgot to. What did you forget this time, I am asked, when I dash back in, only to leave again. And, and yeah, leave, really leave. If you look back at the Gospel readings for the Sunday since Easter, it doesn't take long to realize that many of the selections have the risen Jesus getting in some one more thing instructions to his disciples before eventually, 40 days eventually, so technically last Thursday, leaving his earthly life behind and ascending to heaven, an event remembered by the church as ascension. One of the last things Luke records his saying to them is to stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. This sounds an awful lot like what he says in John 14 about how the Father will send the Holy Spirit as a teacher and reminder. Among the Lord's various last-minute exhortations are the commandment to love one another, to tend his flock, to believe, and to proclaim repentance and forgiveness to all nations in his name. Generally, believe in me and love God, one another, and others. It is tempting to say to Jesus, Go on ahead, Lord. It's, it's okay. We'll be fine. We'll remember everything you told us. It's tempting, but inaccurate. Because we don't remember everything. It's not okay, and we're not fine. 
The past couple of weeks have been full of reminders to me of how not fine we are. Two years since George Floyd's murder. Ten years since Sandy Hook. Just over a year since the Boulder supermarket killings. And racism still devastates our country and destroys lives. Children and teachers are murdered at school, and ordinary citizens are slaughtered as they get their groceries. We may not be in an official war zone, as in Ukraine, where a neighboring foreign country, Russia, is shelling town after town into rubble and trying all possible ways to destroy a people and a culture, which is the definition of genocide. But from Buffalo to Uvalde, Texas, and beyond, we are not okay. On Friday, I heard a radio interview with John Woodrow Cox, author of a book about the lasting effects of gun violence upon children. And a few things stood out for me in that interview. I quote directly, since the shooting at Columbine in 1999, more than 300,000 students have experienced school shootings at school during the school day. That gives us a sense of how exponential the impact is because those 300,000 may have siblings, family, parents, and all of these people are affected. He documents the effects upon children who are often not considered victims of gun violence if they weren't shot themselves. Yet the injuries are real and they are serious. Major depression, PTSD, relentless guilt, anger, crippling anxiety. Lord, we are not okay. Another day, another mass shooting? Actually, it's even more routine than that. By mid-May, by this year's 145th day, there had already been 213 mass shootings in this country. Our bishop, Thomas Bickerton, is now not only our bishop, but he is the president of the United Methodist Council of Bishops. And he sent a letter to all of, all of the members of our conference and connection this week. A few excerpts from that. He writes, In my role as a bishop and as president of the Council of Bishops, whenever events like this happen, the first question asked of me is whether or not I am going to issue a statement. Words put together in response to another horrific act of injustice, violence, racism, or war in our midst. Words that include, thing, include things like our thoughts and prayers are with the victims. Today, I do not have a statement in me. My outrage and anger demands a statement, but my love of people demands action. Further down, he says, we have to come to terms with how we are going to fix this. We absolutely have done nothing different, and as a result, the cycle of violence and the denial of human life just continues. We are paralyzed into a posture of inactivity that only allows the same story and the same response to happen over and over again. And as a result, we live our lives on the defense, always reacting to something that has already taken place around us. My statement today is quite simple. Let's go on the offense. And then, near his conclusion, as a bishop of the church, I refuse to see this period of our lives as a permanent time of disarray. Instead, I choose to see this as an interim time, a time that will not remain as it is, a time that will not be the standard upon which we experience the life we have been blessed to live. As United Methodists, we embrace a gospel and a mission that we state has the power to transform the world. The risk is that they will only be nice words that easily roll off our tongues and just like every statement made at just like every statement made after the latest act of violence the risk is that we will see our current state as a permanent one rather than an interim time
that we can, with the power of God in our midst, change. Our bishop's call to go on the offense, open to the power of God within, within us at work, that is a challenge. There will always be one more thing, because the work of loving God and loving one another and loving our neighbors involves every aspect of our life. Thoughts and prayers? Yes. But also commitment to engage with the local and national community with respect and a genuine desire to hear and be heard? I think of the Braver Angels model of conversations. And also a commitment to pay attention to and hold accountable our elected officials. Oh, and also a commitment to use our own gifts, our personal skills, our time, and our money with integrity. I can sympathize with Jesus' first followers, who according to the Acts 1 account of the Ascension, stood still as their Lord was taken up, gazing up toward heaven where they'd just gotten their last glimpse of the Lord as he was taken from their sight. And it took the gentle chiding of two men in white robes, who I take to be angelic messengers, to get them to stop scanning the clouds looking for divine footprints and make them look back down to earth. When you start to look around in the real world, it gets a lot more complicated than when you're gazing up at the clouds. But here we are. Jesus' parting reminders to the first disciples and us are simple but hard to live into. Love one another and tend my sheep. We've heard it before. Are we finally paying attention? This weekend is Memorial Day here in the United States, when we remember those who died in all of this country's wars. At least that's the idea. In real life, our remembrance of the war dead gets easily pushed aside by parades and picnics and yard sales. Remember why it's a holiday tomorrow. People sacrifice not only their time and their comfort, but their lives for your freedom. Remember also the words of our bishop and of our Lord, even though you've heard them before. Luke points out that Jesus opened the minds of the disciples to understand the scriptures, which I take as encouragement to persist in believing that as we, too, remember our ancient faith and remember who we are and what God has shown us, we also will grow into the disciples and witnesses we are called to be. Will it be easy and obvious what specifically God calls us to do? Likely not. I imagine we'll all need to make frequent prayerful trips to check in with the Lord and one another. And as a start, remember the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, before we
we pray for the needs of those we love and for so many around the world whom we shall perhaps never know, we pause to acknowledge that, like Job, we are sometimes caught up in complicated situations that cause grief and raise questions. There have been times when people have said or done something that has brought pain to our door. We find it hard to let go of those emotions and even harder to forgive. Soften our hearts, God, and help us to forgive others, even as you have forgiven us in Christ. There are also times when it is we who have been at fault. Our words and actions have hurt someone else, either knowingly or unwittingly. We confess that even when we are aware of the tension that has risen, we still find it tough to address the brokenness and we shy away from saying sorry. Give us, we pray, something of the spirit of Jesus instead of launching into a war of wills with others who hurt us or whom we have hurt. Let us become peacemakers, opening the door to reconciliation and healing. We also seek unity of spirit and purpose, along with the healing of broken relationships for our nation and the world. Where there is contention, bring cooperation. Where there is false accusation, let there be truth. Even when differing in opinion from one another, may we do so with mutual respect. This is our prayer also for your church. In our day, may we increasingly be the answer to the prayer of Jesus, whose desire was to see his people be as one. And now, as a church family, we bring before you the special needs of those who are facing hardship at present. Draw very close to all whose burden is heavy. Bring them healing, physical rest, and peace of mind now and in the days to come. These things we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus, who has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And may the peace of Christ, which passes all our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of Christ, this day and forevermore. Amen.